Welcome to Ask the Expert. This is a brief, informative, and lively discussion with experts in T1D and related interdisciplinary research. We're recording this event. We're going to post it on the Sugar Science YouTube site shortly after the presentation. And if you have any questions for our guests, Braden Tierney, please feel free to enter them in the chat or raise your hand at the, end of the, pre at the presentation. And as I just mentioned, we have Braden Tierney, um, who is currently at Harvard, and he's coming to us um, today from Massachusetts. <laughs> and um, Braden, can you give us a thumbnail sketch of your sort of your career path and what excites you most about the research you're working on right now? And then we'll sort of dive into your paper and some of uh, and a couple of your slides. Sure, that sounds great. Um, so thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really thrilled to get to be here and to chat with y'all. Um, so yeah, I just, as, as you said, I just finished up my PhD at Harvard Medical School in the labs of Shirag Patel and Alex Kostick. Um, I came right out of an undergrad into that from Duke and sort of my experience scientifically has been all over the sort of microbiological spectrum. So, you know, I worked at the Marine Biological Labs way back when looking at the structure of the oral microbiome using a fluorescence microscopy and then moved into looking at a root microbiomes and working in industry for a, uh, briefly at a startup doing um, biostimulant development. So a lot of sort of plant microbe interactions. And I basically throughout this brief career, I've, I've kind of gained a deep love of microbes and their sort of ability to act as small self assembling machines and their incredible outsized literally effect they have on on the environment around them. And so when I when I got to HMS, I was so fortunate to work with these incredible two teams, uh, Shirag and Alex's lab, looking specifically at the role of the microbiome in host health and really, really taking kind of a data science approach to it. Because you know, we generate so much, and we'll talk about this briefly, but massive amounts of DNA sequencing data from the gut microbiome, from all these ecosystems, and figuring out how to reproducibly associate microbial features with different human diseases, type 1, type 2 diabetes included, um, is, is not an easy task. And the thing is, doing that association, we realized, is kind of a prerequisite for a lot of the really cool biology we want to look at down the line. So if you want to test the causal, the causality of a particular bug and a particular disease, um, and you start with sequencing data, you have to really know how to bridge that gap between hypothesis generation and hypothesis testing. And so that was really the challenge of my thesis. Um, and we'll talk a little bit a bit today about this, about this paper um, and kind of, which was really kind of uh, trying to achieve that end, showing how we can build robust gene level, what we call metagenomic architectures of human disease. So that's akin to genetic architecture in the sense that genetic architecture, you have human genetic variants associated with disease. These are all of the metagenomic features, pathway species, genes we can identify and their association with disease. Yeah, I know that's, the, um, this is fantastic. You're, you're in, in some senses, you're building like a template or, you know, or like a, uh, a library, right, of, of these, um, of, of this architecture, I guess you want to call it, right? Yeah, so, that's kind of, that's how we think about it, yeah. Yeah, um, and that will be a really great um, working document to interface with type 1 diabetes, I mean, as I see it. That's anyway, cool, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's really, it's really fantastic. So, um, do you want to share a couple slides, or? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can show a couple. Um, I, you know, I have sort of, Six or seven here, uh, and and I think I think it would be worth uh, sort yeah. of talking about um, something interesting. So we're going to kind of start right in the middle. Let me share my screen. Uh, is that showing up? Perfect. Okay, great. Let me. Uh, we're just going to start right here. So I we talked about how uh, one of the sort of prerequisites for getting to a biological understanding of human microbiome disease association, uh, uh, the role of the human microbiome in disease is building uh, associations. And we, you know, I, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on why this is important and biologically, but we know that the human microbiome is implicated in all of these different phenotypes, uh, type one, type two diabetes, cancers, really, really, if there is a phenotype, it's the microbiome has been associated with it. It's, it's pretty, pretty remarkable, but there's, there's an outstanding challenge here that's uh, in some ways unique to the microbiome and its scale. Um, and it's that host environment can confound human microbiome disease associations. So these are two really fun papers that I love from the past five years that are examples of this. So take the paper on the left that shows how metformin 
can confound human microbiome diabetes associations. Um, and so what that means is basically if I'm trying to find the metagenomic architecture type to diabetes, I'm trying to associate a microbe with T2D, uh, and I don't account for the fact that a large population of my patient cohort is likely on the anti-diabetic drug metformin, uh, then I might accidentally find an association between microbe bug X and metformin usage instead of microbug X and type 2 diabetes. That's a confounding effect. And the same could be true for statins uh, and, and BMI and really any, anything in your, in your local environment, your exposome can shift microbiome and potentially confound uh, microbial associations. And so let's say, again, you're trying to fit this little linear model. And if you're not familiar with this form, this is basically numerically saying, we're going to compare the average abundance of microbe X and type 2 diabetes cases versus controls. This is an example of a simple univariate linear model. It's most commonly used in a lot of microbiome studies and sort of data-driven analyses in general. Um, but if we know metformin confounds this relationship, one way to deal with this problem is adjusting for it. And so this is where you would literally add a variable to this model written here, um, which and this now equates to comparing the abundance of microbe X and types of diabetes cases versus controls adjusted for accounting for if patients were on metformin. So you are controlling for that confounding effect. And I'm not going to go into more detail on sort of the stats underlying that. If you want to, we can, we can talk about it. Um, and so this is great, but there's a problem. Like I said, what if you don't know the possible confounders, yeah. right? Because there's so much that can confound microbiome associations. So um, this is really kind of where our, our work comes in. Uh, and we use this technique that I'm about to talk about in the paper that you, you contacted me about. Um, and it's called modeling vibration of effects. And so in, summer, in short, we are proposing using modeling vibration of effects as a link to as form a sensitivity analysis, is what it's called, to identify robust, non-confounded microbiome disease associations and identify why certain ones are confounded if they are. So here's an example. This is actually from a different project that's in revision, but I really wanted to show it to you because it's about type 1 diabetes. Mm -hmm. So consider this plot where you have, it's, and I'm going to walk through what everything means. It's kind of, uh, it looks like a normal volcano plot, but what you need to know is that the x-axis is an association size, so positive or negative. Streptococcus is positively associated with T1D or negatively associated. And the y-axis is a negative log 10 p value. So the solid line would represent uh, nominal significance, so less than 0.05. Mm -hmm. Every point here represents a different model specification, a different modeling strategy. So let me zoom in on two. Here's one. So you remember those linear models. Now we have a whole bunch of different adjusters. Instead of metformin, we have birth sex, days from sample collection, infant age, birth method, all these different things. And here's another one that's also just barely significant. Look at how similar these two models are. Yeah. Um, but they yield literally opposite results. One of them has a positive association on that T1D variable. The other has a negative association on that T1D variable. And this is getting at something we call researcher degrees of freedom, where if you ask 100 people to answer the same question uh, in a data set, you're probably going to get 100 slightly different methods for doing so, which could yield 100 slightly different answers. And so this is what we consider vibration of effects, how your association, or in some cases, effect size changes as a function of model specification. And this is really one of the tools underlying our data-driven analysis in that paper. Um, and so this is what we would call this non-robust. You, right? you have a lot of opposite sign associations. Um, but again, it's important to think about, you know, why the sign might flip here. So we also can use VOE to tease out, like, see how we adjusted for human leukocyte antigen genotype in the negative model, and we didn't in the right-hand model. So yeah. that indicates not anything causal, but it indicates that there might be an interesting relationship between HLA, the genus strep, and T1D. It's not saying, and this was a published association. This is from a paper where we looked at about 600 published associations and computed VOE on them. Um, it's not saying anything's wrong. <laughs> it's just saying we need to think a little bit harder about this. Um, and so that's the under sort of the, the data behind the method. And so we decided to use VOE, vibration of effects, to ask if there were robust microbiome disease indicators that were shared 
or unique across different phenotypes. And that's how we got to this paper titled Robust Gene Level Metagenomic Architectures Across Seven Diseases. Um, and this was with Jason Tan, a spectacular, really, really gifted intern who helped carry this project over the finish line. Um, and so basically, here's what we did. We took 1.1 million microbiome taxon pathway and gene abundances, so either microbial taxonomies, the metabolic pathways contained within, or the abundances of individual genes. And then we computed associations and ran our vibration of effects analysis for all of the features. Um, and we ended up with plots like the one you saw. So some robust associations, some non-robust associations. So here's on the top you have, oh, and, and I'll walk through what the diseases are in a moment, but there are colorectal cancer, type two diabetes, the two examples here, but we were looking across a bunch to see if we could see uh, common signatures of disease, right? And so this is a robust negative association. You can see all the signs are negative regardless of model specification. Whereas this one, you have again, a mild Janus effect. And this dotted line, the plots are the same as before. The dotted line is just now false discovery rate adjusted significance. Um, and so well, I only have like uh, two-ish more slides. We fit, and this is also computationally you know, miserable, right? We fit 70 million models um, because you're fitting two to the N models where N is the total number of adjusters that you possibly have because you're doing every combination. A lot of work. Uh, so it, was, it was funny. <laughs> and so we asked the question, here's this, can we biologically characterize the genes uh, associated with two phenotypes? Well, I, and I say it was funny because it was, um, it, it was, a, it was a, a silly amount of work to do. And, you know, in, in some ways, I, I look forward to figuring out how we can make it uh, more efficient down the line. But, but anyway, so- Well, you got to start and, somewhere. Yeah, exactly. You got to start somewhere. And so, uh, so anyway, we asked, can we biologically characterize genes associated with two phenotypes? This is my favorite figure from this paper because, and there's a lot going on here. We're actually going to zoom in just on one portion of it. Uh, but it's basically showing the best possible taxonomic annotation of all of these 6,000 genes we could find that were associated with at least two different phenotypes. And you can see the phenotypes listed down here. Yeah. Uh, every, the colors in the middle rings correspond to the fraction of genes with a given taxonomic annotation um, that were associated with that phenotype. And the outer ring corresponds to if it was a positive or a negative association. There's a huge amount going on here. Um, so let me just quickly zoom into the top of it. So I'm going to highlight this one particular bug, Solobacterium moray. Um, and I think what I'm going to show you, I hope will sort of hit at the heart as to kind of what I'm really excited about in this paper. So you can see we're kind of in the upper quadrant here. There were 662 genes that were associated with Solobacterium moray that were annotated as coming from that bug that species. And they were associated most strongly, all of them, all 662 were associated with both colorectal cancer and coronary artery disease. Um, and there was something, but there was something uh, weird about this. This was our gene level analysis, right? We're looking at genes and the taxonomic annotations. When we did the just reference-based taxonomy analysis, so we said, what's the abundance of Solobacterium more overall? Mm -hmm. So using a set of marker genes, what's the abundance of the species? The result wasn't flagged as robust. Only when we look at the gene level do we mm -hmm. see a number of genes that are robust. And so what's going on here? Um, we went back to that species level result. And this, and here's what the plot looked like. If you look just at, you know, here are the genes that we think come from the species Solobacterium more. Again, every point represents different modeling strategies. You can see this is a, a weak result, right? If I'm a researcher and I look at this and I say, this is not worth pursuing, yeah. it looks like it's not robust, but here's the catch. There are four strains that we know of, of Solobacterium moray, that are wrapped up in this species level annotation. Hmm. We went and we then thought, okay, what are the strain level annotations as best as we can tell, because that's hard to do, for those 662 genes that were associated with both CRC and ACVD. And it hmm. turns out they all appear to come from one strain. Wow. And when you look at, and this is overlaying all 662 plots, uh, highly robust, right? So left, and so basically what, what I want to get across here is like, imagine, <laughs> I have to imagine this because I'm mostly computational. Imagine you're a wet lab researcher, right? And I'm a bioinformatician and I say, hey, I have this plot on the left, you know, um, pick a strain, put it in a mouse and, you know, see if you have, if you can find anything with causality here you have a three out of four shot of potentially your experimental failing, experiment failing because of a technical artifact. 
So you're not even gonna get to the biology. Whereas if you have the plot on the right, if you have done gene level analysis, if you have computed vibration of effects, you can say with at least higher confidence that this is the strain you're interested in. Even if the strain annotation is not correct, you have 600 marker genes. So when you isolate Solobacterium morae from humans with CRC, you know exactly how you should mark the strain that you want to then test for causality in a future wet lab experiment. Yeah, so, you're, you're totally zooming in. Right, you're zooming in. You're, you're getting zooming the, way in. Right. And this is like an absolutely great way to form a diagnostic uh, I, Thank you. Experiment, that's, experiment or like form your hypothesis. It's like thank a you. great way that's, to form a that, hypothesis. That means a lot. That really does because I'm so excited about this. It and, is um, really cool. Oh, when I read the paper, I was like really blown away. I thought it was great. That really means a lot. And so that's the that's the last thing basically. The we're the next thing we're doing is we're applying this to T1D. We have uh, two longitudinal T1D data sets that that are publicly available but have not been explored on the gene level. Okay. And so we've computed vibration of effects, we've computed associations, and we're working on predicting, uh, basically finding architectures of T1D longitudinally, and then using those to predict disease onset. And this plot is just showing preliminary data where the accuracy of prediction, the AUC of our little, of our different classifiers uh, with different data types, as we did before, demographics is just no microbiome data. Um, and you can see we're getting pretty high accuracy in the sort of 0 0.8, 0 0.9 area and our ability to discriminate between future diabetes, future seroconverters uh, versus healthy individuals who do not ever seroconvert. And so we're zooming in on this, we're going antibody by antibody, we're looking at T1D, we're looking at seroconversion, we're looking at HLA, we're looking at all this stuff uh, to really try and say, can we predict which infants are going to become type one diabetic so you can apply preventative treatments for beforehand. So I think the hypothesis generation thing is one side of this, and then really the, the sort of prevention through prediction aspect is another is another part of this. I'm really excited about. And yeah, um, no, anyway, it's, that's it's all. a two part it's a two part story, right? Because we all we still don't even know the 100 years after you know insulin's been discovered and used, still don't even know that the, what drives the etiology of this disease. Right. It's wild. It's I know. Just, so it's yeah. like let's get going. I and yeah. this is a really a way forward. I think. It's and I'd be. Thank you. I'd be curious what you think, and uh, if 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 um if you think we even have the disease classified correctly. So given that, wow. like, do you? I mean, in terms of is type one diabetes, is that it? Is it just you know our our definition, our observational definition from however long ago when it was first identified, was um is that accurate, or do we need to reconsider because there might be a thousand different causes? I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's becoming more clear that there's like many roads to become to to get type one diabetes, and then it presents in a very heterogeneous fashion too. Like kids who get it, you know, two and under, you know, they have a different, you know, um, I like phenotype almost. And then when people get older, it's again a different sort of presentation, different phenotype, different. Um, you know, they look at the, the GWAS people are showing that the different things are involved there. So it's kind of, it, it is really interesting. And there are a bunch of papers. I mean, I've always been very curious because in the older, you know, the, the classical presentation age, I guess is like teen years, 13 years old or around that age. And um, there's definitely a big alteration in microbiome, sorry, um, okay. at that point. And so you kind of wonder, okay, um, this is a big alteration and, and we should really kind of take that group of people, I guess, and, and really look at different windows of diagnosis, like look at the younger, look at the older um, state of onset and, and kind of drill down on, uh, on what's happening in the microbiome then. It definitely is an alteration. And one thing I've been thinking about a lot, one of the biggest antibodies that, um, or the, you know, that, that shows up as a biomarker for people that are going to be progressing to type one is mm -hmm. GAD, right? Yeah. So GAD is there. So is that so weird? Because we have get a lot of people have we have GAD antibodies uh, in in the body. Normally healthy people have it, and it's like not no big deal. So what's going on? And one thing that's kind of weird is like we know that there's a whole micro set of microbiome that produce actually GABA in the gut, right? Mm -hmm. So I love think, this hypothesis. This is yeah. my favorite. This is my favorite too. One day hypothesis. Right. I know. Me too. I've been yeah. thinking about it for a while. And so they have GAD, obviously. Now, is that GAD sixty five inside those micro bacteria? Mm -hmm. you no. Know, I mean, or is it GAD sixty seven? What is it? Or is it something else? And so anyway, so GAD 
is inside there. You're, you're imagining here's the microbiome and um, maybe somebody had antibiotics or they had a virus and they're, you know, their tight junctions got, are blown open or whatever for some, maybe they're gluten sensitive. And now suddenly these <clears throat> uh, GABA producers undergo apoptosis for whatever reason, spill out their guts, GAD is released. Yeah. And somehow, you know, the M cells are there and all the, uh, you know, the Pyres patches are right there and they're like, what's this? <laughs> and, you know, in the neighborhood is the pancreas. So, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of, it's just, it's just sort of a thought experiment. It's totally, you know, I, I think unproven. That's so worth well, that's one of the reasons why we're so interested in looking at antibody specific microbiome uh, triggers or responses or whatever you want to think about it as, because yeah. And I can tell, I can't, I don't, I literally don't have this data like in a presentable form right now. It's not that it's secret or anything like that, but when we have gone through and run our vibration of effects analysis for each individual antibody in these cohorts, you see, I, I'd have to look it up exactly, but you know, um, GAD, I think has the most microbial genes that are predictive, predictive of someone being positive, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the other antibodies have, you know, an order of magnitude fewer. And so you're seeing differing levels of microbiome response or different levels of prediction given, depending on the specific antibody, which I think lends credence to this sort of trigger hypothesis that you might be getting in, like there's apoptosis and there's immune system training or whatever it might be. Um, and so I really look forward to being able to show that data because it's going to be- Yeah, really we can't wait to see it. I think it's going to be really, um, it's going to be like, I think it's going to be very innovative. This approach is innovative. And I think that you're going to come up with, you're going to mine some really interesting data with it. Um, but yeah, Thank is there anybody else who would like to ask a question at this point? Or just, just I'll continue talking. <laughs> um, I did have one question. Jump oh. in a little. Yeah, go ahead, Tiffany. Yeah, I am not a bioinformatics at all. Um, but I found the hypotheses really interesting, especially about what happens after individual has that tip into diagnosis of T1D in their microbiome? Um, is it building upon each other, these like different results you get? And does it get like worse and worse or? So I think I want to make sure I fully understand. So you're asking, uh, are the, so are the, are the individual results we're getting are there, are they building upon, what do you mean building upon each other in what way? Because I think you're onto something and I, yeah. I, think I just want to make sure I fully, I fully am answering it correctly. Yeah. And so we, you had a really nice discussion about like your data and serum conversion, which can lead to like type one diabetes and diagnosis, mm -hmm. but what about afterwards and the altered microbiome is, nice. are things just further exacerbated? Like, do these yeah. results still hold up after that zero conversion? That is, that is such a good question. So the kind of, uh, the longitudinal nature of microbiome shifts, in my opinion, is, is vastly underexplored um, because, you know, most of us, they, the basic linear modeling strategies I showed you are not optimized for longitudinal data. You usually would use a mixed model for that. Um, but that is something we are going to have to do. I can tell you that in, in this sort of T1D analysis, we see more features associated with post seroconversion than pre seroconversion. Now that could be insanely confounded, right? Because what if after seroconversion, your diet changes or your lifestyle changes or something. And so I have a feeling a lot of those aren't going to reproduce in multiple cohorts. Um, but I think uh, I, 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 it's, it's still, I think, worth pursuing. One of the things I've wanted to look at for years is what I've been thinking of as microbiome scarring. So to what degree does a past event like leave these permanent marks on your microbiome? And I think for the seroconversion trigger hypothesis, that's really important because if it's you know a spontaneous, you have this bug for one day and then you're going to seroconvert, that's going to be hard to spot. Um, and it will be you know hard to tell if that was the cause 10 years down the line. But it might be that you have one lingering um, horizontally transferred gene, or you might have one thing that sort of has left a little scar in your gut microbiome, um, so to speak. So I don't know. That's a really good question. <laughs> it's like, could you actually isolate the remained remaining constituents of the microbiome and see if there's any epigenetic changes in them, you know, or whatever, whatever. Uh, totally. so, yeah. So a lot of the, the microbiome high C stuff, I think is going to be really interesting for that kind of work down the line. But um, it's such a, 
it's a system that's just, you know, nonsense to work with. <laughs> it's, it's so crazy working with that. I mean, we need to, I think, our, that our- one, That one, that one um, you know, that one figure showed it all. Like it's had so many, you know, in the circle, right. that large, I don't know what that graph is called. Oh yeah, I, it doesn't, I don't know. Okay. You can make up the name right now if you want. Okay, we just the, circle the, the circle starburst. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, right. it was just Starburst, amazing. oh, I love that. There <laughs> were so <laughs> many, I mean, there's so many variables in that thing. It's like, oh yeah. no. And then you ask, you know, what, how much of the microbial community are you actually detecting next generation sequencing? You know, how accurate are the genes that you're calling? What is, what is a gene in the microbiome? That was one of the early things I was asked in my thesis. You know, if you're comparing two genes, are they the same if they're 30% identical or 90% identical? Or like, how do you even? And so there are so many, technically, I mean, this is, you know, there are careers to be built upon teasing out the weeds. Totally. <laughs> I mean, this is a frontier. Right. And so it's so exciting for scientists to, I would, you know, I would just say that there's so many exciting experiments to be done at this frontier. I, I would agree. But, um, but, and so I'm, I'm curious with, with the amount you all are thinking, cause you know, I'm so terrible at human biology and immunology. I really am. Um, that uh, I, I'm thinking with the amount that you are thinking about sort of the, the pancreas and, you know, this potential trigger hypothesis to what degree do you all think that we might actually have microbial colonization in some of these super low foreign biomass sites? Like we see here hypotheses about microbes and well, and you know, all these and you know, the blood is you know, you see the blood microbiome, you see uh, there's what's there's the, the birth canal, there's you know, and then there's you could ask about the pancreas. And I'm specifically curious to the pancreas is there some body of literature where people have said this is this is weird DNA, what's this doing in here? Or do you That's think it's really a really good question in all the information um, in, in the, the literature I've read and the people we've spoken to, I've never once heard anyone ask that question. It's a really good question. Well, I mean, I, I don't, again, I don't know if it's the, now, yeah, well, thank you. I, I, have no I would idea. say yeah. I would, I would contact, you know, Mark Atkinson down in University of Florida and yeah. ask him for some nod tissue sure if he, he has some and I mean, I'm sorry for NPOD tissue and um, and maybe look for some. Yeah, and do some staining or something. I don't know. It's so those those experiments are so hard. <laughs> I don't know, but um, I don't know. But, uh, you've got your PhD. What's next for you? Um, I'm heading to uh, Weill Cornell for a postdoc, so in Manhattan, which is going to be super fun. We're still working, we're extending a lot of the, the sort of T1D work into that time and continuing using the methods we've developed during the thesis to you know, build robust associations and predict diabetes and disease and all these things. But what's cool about this lab is we're also, they also have a, a serious interest in uh, sort of other forms of the ways microbes influence their environment. So like the space microbiome, they're the people who did the NASA twin study and all that stuff. And so it's a lot of sort of human using microbes to monitor human health and space flights. Um, and also doing some work with like coral and environmental microbiology because I miss, uh, I miss those days. And um, so it's kind of be kind of all over the place, but what's nice is we have this foundation of tools that I would, I really, you know, I want to try and get people using in the field if they, if they feel like it's worth it. That sounds like a really rich environment. And frankly, I think there's so much to be learned from other systems. So you never know, oh, yeah. something can overlap in that Venn diagram world. What's the, um, who's, what's the name of the lab that you're going to? Chris Mason. Oh, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we love talking to you. <clears throat> this well, thank is you. fantastic. Good. Thank you so much. And we can't Pleasure. wait to hear again yeah. uh, what's coming. Yeah, I'll keep you posted. And thank you really for the, it's, uh, thank you for the invite. And it's so nice to see you, Tiffany, again. And all the, and the whole MBL connection is just astounding. I mean, Kay, I don't know if you were at MBL, but we have 75% of the people here, I think, or at least on that. <laughs> I don't think she was. <laughs> um, that's so funny. Well, thanks again, Ray. Great. Well, yeah, thanks Stop for talking. taking the time. And uh, please feel free to reach out if you have any other questions. We will.